Hello, and welcome to the Giving Voice to Depression podcast. We are your co-hosts, Bridget and Terry. Each week, through intimate, candid conversations with guests, we explore different perspectives on and experiences of depression. We keep it real because the illness is real. We keep it hopeful because there truly is hope in spite of what depression tells you. We are not experts or therapists. We are sisters and best friends who live with depression and have interviewed hundreds of other people who do as well. We've learned that hearing others speak openly and without shame about their experiences makes it easier to believe depression is a common and treatable illness, not a personal failing. You are far from alone. Hi, Terry. Hello, Bridget. Welcome to Season 17 of the Giving Voice to Depression podcast. Have you ever heard a lyric in a song that reminds you of your depression or how it makes you think and feel? Like the line in Ingrid Michaelson's Still Breathing, I want to change the world, instead I sleep. Sarah Bareilles' song Brave has the lyric, Maybe there's a way out of the cage where you live. Maybe one of these days you can let the light in. And rapper NF's songs have a lot that hit home for us, including I want to know what it's like to be happy. I want to know what it's like to wake up in the morning and feel like it's real when I'm laughing. I want to know what it's like to sit down with my friends and feel like they might understand me. Or she used to laugh, but now she's crying, sick of the pain. She puts on her mask, pretends, and acts like she's okay. For me, it's usually just a phrase that strikes a chord or stops me and makes me think, yeah, that's what it's like. But I'd never heard a full song that resonated on a deep level until I recently met singer-songwriter Dimitra Prohaska. We were on a mental health panel discussion together, and I asked if she'd written any songs specifically about her mental health struggles. She picked up her phone, scrolled to some lyrics she'd written, and just started singing an original piece a cappella. Now, I'm not much of a crier, but as the cameras rolled, recording the discussion for use in schools, tears just poured down my face as I thought of how she must have felt writing that, and how many others feel or have felt that same hopeless way. In that moment, we knew we had to invite Demetra to share her story and her talents here. We'll begin with a bit of her mental health journey, and then we'll focus on her haunting song. Here now is Dimitra Prohaska giving her voice to depression. Dimitra is a self-taught piano and guitar player who's been writing songs since her early teens, about the same age that her parents divorced, and she first suspected she was depressed. I don't remember, like, the... You know, like how old I was when I was like aware of it, you know, because nobody really, nobody, nobody talked about it when I was like 12, 13. So like, what, like eight, nine years ago, like it was kind of this taboo subject. That didn't stop Demeter from talking about it, though. She is a fierce self-advocate. Did you go to a friend, a guidance counselor at school? A parent, you know, who did you say, like, hey, something's wrong? I really confided in, like, when I was 14 in my high school guidance counselor. Yeah, I told her, like, basically everything as much as I could just to get it out and to, like, you know, like, make me feel not alone. And, like, some teachers I would confide in, too, at, at school. And, like, it was safe for the most part. I should say for, like, authority-wise. So when we say tell a trusted adult, that's not Mm -hmm. just like a bumper sticker or something in a pamphlet. That actually is good advice, and it helped you? Mm Mm-hmm. It did help me. Especially because, like, I felt, for me, I felt like I couldn't, at that time, I couldn't turn to my parents. So I go to school and do their, like, I felt like they were sometimes, like, more helpful, you know? I felt heard, like, basically, like, the feeling of being heard. It's, like, it's a whole, like, feeling experience in itself. So, like, I didn't feel like I was just, like, 
talking to them and then they'd be like, oh, okay, you know. Like, I felt like they, like, genuinely cared about my well-being. So I guess it was, like, looking for that aspect as well. Like, wanting to feel heard and wanting to feel like I mattered. While still in high school, Demetra's situation worsened. She ended up spending 10 months in a residential treatment center. She freely admits that in the beginning, she was not, as she puts it, committed to change. And it was like, when I first got there, like the first four months, it was me basically like in fear, like, oh, like how long do people stay here? And like, oh, like what's, what do I expect here, you know? And then the first four months, I was just, like, testing everything, like, oh, like, I can leave, you know, because I was used to, like, I was in, like, the foster system at the time. So I was just, like, used to going placement to placement after, like, a month or something. So not, like, long-term stays. But eventually, Demetra says something shifted, and she opened to her treatment and recovery process. Sure, people sometimes fake it till they make it, but I was, like... If I'm here, I'm going to make the most of it. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that was, those first four months, it was kind of like, what can I get away with? What can I do here? Like, what's the, you know, how are they going to do this? And then since then, it was like, I'm here. I've accepted I'm here. Like, I'm going to, you know, make the best of it. And I'm glad I did. Because to this day, I still keep in contact with the people there. Like, the people that helped me there and the people that are still there, at least. Now 22, Demetra says she literally doesn't even remember the person she was back then. You know, I sometimes look back at my life and I'm like, wow, like, I'm kind of embarrassed of, like, who I was before, like, treatment. I mean, I get at the time, it was like, that was what I knew, and that was, like, what helped me at that point. Like, I would, like, self-harm and stuff, and, you know, like, do, like, the, what I thought could be, like, the craziest thing to, like, get attention or, like, be heard. But, like, I know some parents and, like, kids are in, like, denial about a lot of stuff. And, like, I was in denial, too, about a lot of stuff. I mean, I still took that opportunity, you know, to, like, go get help. And if this were a fairy tale or after-school special, we'd tie a pretty bow around Demetra's story and say she lived happily ever after, after treatment. But you're listening to a podcast on depression, so you know better. So does Demetra. So instead, fast forward six years to 2020, a global pandemic, and a time Demetra describes as unbearable. Like, I don't, I can't really describe how it was. It was just for months straight, like constant, like every day. Like, I was just exhausted every day. And I was like, I know I haven't felt like this before. And I know I've been happy at some point, and I just missed the feeling of being happy. And I knew it was possible, and I said, I just don't want to, you know, live a life like this, because I knew that I was so far in that I was like, I I don't know what else to do right now. I need to to write everything down how I'm feeling. What Demetra wrote was intense, visceral, and hauntingly beautiful. When I wrote this song, it was, I was practically like really depressed, like pretty like suicidal. So I was like, I need to like be real for a minute, you know, because I'm like, I say I'm depressed all the time, but I'm like, I, I need to really try to write something right now. And real she was, really real. Tears and notes and words spilled from Demetra. And within minutes, she had composed and recorded the beginning of I'm Not Okay. Just a warning, if you get emotional when words touch you, this probably will. We'll play the first minute. I feel his pain 
like it'll never go away. Such a shame that I may never. We warned you. Powerful, right? And there are some really noteworthy word choices, like the very first lines. Um, the first two lines, it says, I don't want to die, don't want to live a life like this, I admit. It's a distinction suicide attempt survivors regularly make, that it's the situation and the pain more than life itself they're trying to escape. I mean, it was really hard to differentiate the two because in the moment you're like I can't do it anymore and it's it was for me like the suicidal thoughts or whatever the ideation I should say was more like I just want to feel different like I just want to feel something because I know like my family and friends or whatever couldn't bear to have me like gone or like the people that care about me I knew that so that was really the point that stopped me most like from ever really acting on anything um but yeah don't want to live a life like this and the song continues with a literal cry for help but even in that Demetra leaves room for hope i want to scream at the top of my lungs someone please help me because right now Did you catch it? She says, right now, I don't think I'll ever be okay. She's in it. It's unbearable. She's exhausted. And yet, Demetra is still able to hold on to the truth that she hasn't always felt that hopeless and that she might not at some point in the future. It's really something. I mean, for me, it was just because, like, I've I've done it before. Hmm. Like, I've been in a dark place and I've come out of it. So for me, it was like, I know I can, I know it'll pass eventually. I just didn't want to feel that way for like as long as I was feeling that way, you know, because it was like months and months and months. And I was like, when is this, when is it going to end really for, for me? But I knew, I knew it was going to eventually that I was going to pull out of it and be able to take a step back and cope and, um, I guess, not put so much pressure on myself because that's what I, I did that a lot. Or I, I mean, I do that a lot, really. Like I, I'm kind of a perfectionist, so I have these high expectations and if I don't meet them, my mood goes crashing down. One of the reasons we refer to Demetra as a fierce self-advocate is that when she crashes, she actually does the thing we're all told to do, but maybe feel like we can't or just don't, which is to reach out. I'm just a pretty, like, open person. Like, I'm not the type of person who's, like, hiding, like, uh, like, I'm feeling kind of depressed. Like, I'm just going to put on a smile and pretend I'm fine. Like, I can't, I can't do that personally, like... I can't do it. It's for me it would it would be like more more effort for me to do that than to just be like, "Hey, like I'm feeling this way and I'm not I can't even lie either. I I suck at lying. I can't do it. I'm like, you know, I'm feeling this way. I got to be honest, like this like I'm struggling right now. Like I need just please be patient with me." as I am dealing with this. In treatment, Demetra has also learned other coping skills, things she can do by herself, for herself. I need to, like, just take everything day by day and not jump, like, a whole month or two or three ahead and be like, oh, I'm, you know, like, stressed out about stuff I don't even know yet. I just need to be in the present moment and... Um, like, you know, yeah, check in with myself. Like, how are you feeling right now? Are you okay or are you not okay? If you're not okay, 
all right, what are we going to do about it, you know? Do you need a do you need a nap? Do you need to eat right now? Do you need to do this? Do you need to call a friend? You know? I'm pretty I'm pretty good with that. It's just sometimes in the moment it's like okay, like what am I going to do now? So just really doing that every day. This next part of our discussion and Demetra's song include the words crazy and insane, which we acknowledge as stigmatizing language. We also acknowledge that in the depths of a depression, it can be pretty easy to go there. I just reach out to people and I'm like, I need, I need some, like someone talk to me, tell me I'm not going insane. Tell me I'm not like crazy right now because sometimes, you know, your your mind can tell you things and it's like, I need... I mean, sure, you could say it's like reassurance seeking, but like at the point, it's like, I just need like anything else to get me to see it differently, you know, than what I'm telling myself or what the depression is saying, you know, kind of like, yeah, just tell me like, like what, like one good thing I've done for you or something. It's like, like, just help me remind myself like my worth and like that I'm going to be okay. In the end. These four white walls are caving in, don't even know where to begin. And all these thoughts that are in my mind drive me insane. I can't wait another day. Hear me out, I'm not okay. I'm not okay. Demetra wrote that song in June of 2020. It was November before she saw her doctor, and January before she got into an inpatient program and then graduated to an outpatient program, which ended just days before our interview. To be honest, I think after I wrote that song, like, you know, it it was just, like, in such, I was in such a downward spiral, it was just getting worse and worse after I wrote that song. Um, It didn't get any better until um, I spoke to my doctor that day, and then I got help. And, like, sometimes you can't do it alone. So, like, I was just fed up with it. I was like, I can't. I can't do this anymore. Like, I I know, like, my limits, and my limits are, I, I couldn't, I couldn't handle it alone. So sometimes you need that extra support. And that's what I got. Wow, Demetra just shared with us so many coping skills. You know, asking for help, reaching out to others, asking people to be patient. Do I need an app? Do I need to eat? All of it. I mean, reflecting on... Asking, I mean, what an act of courage to ask people to reflect back to you your value or your worth or your contribution because you totally lose touch of what your value is when you're in a hard place. Right. Just tell me one thing I've done for you. Tell me, tell me who I am. Remind me. Remind me of my value. Exactly. Yeah, I learned a lot from her. And a, right? So wise and such a beautiful song. I literally had goosebumps on my goosebumps. <laughs> I've never even heard that, but I must say... Well, it's, it was literal. <laughs> well, having cried in public while I was being recorded, I can say it had the exact same effect on me. So uh, I'm really grateful to her. Which says a lot, because you really don't no, cry much. it does say a lot. So, And and a shout out to the counselors and teachers, not only in Demetra's life, but in so many people's, um, you know, that she was able to feel heard is is just so huge. As she said, it's a whole experience in itself. And also just a quick revisit of uh, the last thing that Demetra said, where she said, I just couldn't do it anymore. I knew my limits, and I couldn't handle it alone. So sometimes you just need that extra support. I don't know if we're in a position to give permission, if anybody needs permission, but um, if somebody is listening to this and just needs a little nudge that it's okay to say, I'm not okay, this was quite the nudge. And for those of us who are always looking for a way to support 
somebody who needs support. I mean, over and over, we're told, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle that moment. Holding up that mirror to reflect back their value and contribution is a doable, free thing that we can all do. Even if they don't ask for it, we can do that. Very, very good point. And I think it's not only doable and free, but I think it's powerful. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Demetra. Thank you, Bridget. And I'm so glad to be starting season 17 of this podcast. And we're going to close this episode out by playing Demetra's full song, I'm Not Okay. It will last about two and a half minutes long. And we'll also link to Demetra's YouTube channel so that you can hear more of her music. Thank you for sharing so much of your wisdom with us, Demetra. We truly hope that our podcast brings a little more understanding, helps you better articulate your experience of depression, or better understand how to support someone else's. We invite you to join us for daily posts on the Giving Voice to Depression Facebook page and on Twitter and Instagram at Voice Depression. It is a comfort to be among fellow travelers on depression's dark road. And remember, if you're struggling, speak up. If someone else is, listen up.